What's going on, everybody? Scouts 311 here, and this is the Battle of Five Armies, the sequel to War of the Ring, one of my favorite games of all time. War of the Ring, one of the greatest games ever made, con considered by many to be one of the finest design games ever, and I agree with that. Um, so what Battle of Five Armies is, is basically... War of the Rings light, in a way. But War of the Rings is an epic game spanning all the way from the Grey Havens all the way to Mordor and from Erebor down to the South Rounds and Minas Tirith. Battle of Five Armies is basically just the Battle of Five Armies at the end of The Hobbit. So it's one focused battle instead of a whole four-hour epic game. It's about an hour and a half-ish. This is an hour or more on the box. Um, so, you're able to play, you get that look, that War of the Ring feeling, but not as much stuff going on. It's basically one battle, but it's still a very fun game. Now, this is a two player game, really, in all accounts. Um, I'm going to play it solo of both sides, and um, which is doable, actually. You just, you know, I mean, I play it for the theme. It's still fun to me to do that. Um, I try to see how I can like, play which side better. And just see what happens. Um, and, you know, so basically, you just do the best movie you think you should do at the time. That's how I'm going to do it. And mostly, I'm going to show off how the game works for those of you who haven't played it and might be interested in something like this. So, alright, let's get started with setup. I have the board placed here. We have, here is the board. We have all the cards and free army people here on the left. The shadow army on the right with the red. We have all the character cards here. Um, I'll go over all this stuff as we go. And those are the decks of cards that get the story cards and um, event cards and fake cards there, and a number of tokens in the back of the board. We'll go over all the stuff as we as we need it and we go through the everything. Okay, so obviously step one is put the board on the table. Um, which makes a lot of sense and leave enough room for everything. Step two is the recruitment tokens. We separate those. Um, there's two kinds of recruitment tokens for the free peoples. The green ones on the right are for the elves, the blue are for the men and the dwarves. And then um, we put the one of the red ones there are for the shadow army. And we have to separate the dwarves and men and the elf ones, keep them separate. Um, and we shuffle them and put them face down in their piles. We're not supposed, not supposed to see what what you have. You don't actually see what the unit is until you recruit them later after they're placed. Um, we put all our tokens on the board, all our armies on the board now. So we're going to do that next. And the game comes with a map here to show where they all are placed. And normally I would have these already placed, but in War of the Ring it takes a long time. And this game is not too bad. So I think we'll just place them in as we go here. And I'll show you how the setup works. These are the heroes of the game. They're not... Some of them are set up in the beginning. And I'll show you that. And some of them are not. And I'll show that. Um... So let's go by regions. So region 1, back here in uh, Erebor, is one Dwarven veteran. I'll show these units off as I place them. That's one reason I wanted to show the placements, so you could see them. So this is a Dwarf regular. You see, very cool looking, and you can tell he's the regular um, for the, the axe and the large rock thing that he's standing on here. So he gets placed at the front gate, which is basically the front gate of Erebor, the Lonely Mountain. And another dwarf veteran gets placed just south of these goblin tunnels right here. And then Bard, the hero, of course, who um, shot Smog down in The Hobbit. Here's his figure. Come on, focus. There we go. Here's Bard, the bowman. He gets placed in the eastern spur right here, along with one 
lake man unit, which are the bows. The bowmen here are the lake man units. He gets placed here as well. And a dwarven recruitment token and men recruitment token also goes there. So we come here, we grab a random one, and we place it in their space upside down so we don't see what it is until we actually get the ability to flip it over and recruit a unit there. Uh, Dane goes in camp. Dane here. Show him off. Here is Dane, Ironfoot. He is in camp right outside of the Lonely Mountain there. And he gets a dwarf for regular with him, which are the weaker of the two dwarfs. We, have the, we already saw the elite. Here's the regular. He's holding a warhammer of some sort. So they're in camp along with another dwarf and men recruitment token. So we'll put one down here. Then over here to the west, just outside of this goblin point, is a elf spearman. And here are the elven spearmen. Alright, very cool. He is here. And just south of him, southeast of the Fallen Bridge, which is one of the main areas of the game we have to defend, is an elf recruitment token, not an actual unit yet. At the Fallen Bridge. And then um, in the ruins of Dale, which is right here in the middle of the map, right in the middle of the valley there, we get um, one lake man there, along with one dwarfs and man recruitment token. Just to the east of that, right on those on the border of the river, on the ford there are two lake men get placed here guarding the river and then over here in, Rip in uh, Raven Hill we get two of our first, or uh, we get two of our uh, heroes, we have Gandalf here along with Thranduil the King of Mer the uh, Elves, Merkwood Elves. He's placed there, and they also get two, or uh, one Elf Spearman, and two Elf Recruitment Tokens. So you get a little backup over here. And then just east of them on the lower slopes is the remaining Free People's Army, two Elven Archers. We haven't seen them yet. Our elven archers, and they also get one elf recruitment token with them. All right, so that's the free people setup when it comes to the units. So, not a lot of units for the free people, kind of like War of the Ring, they're at a severe disadvantage numbers wise. This game is asymmetrical, just like War of the Ring. Each side is kind of playing two different games. The free people are trying to hold out and defend while the Shadow Army is just trying to attack and take land. But that's how it looks at here once we get our free people out. So now we move over to the Shadow Army. So first we get our goblins. So these points here are, are goblin tunnels, basically. And there's a token here that you place between them. Goblins recruit here, once five, and you place this here, it's like a wall. They're digging through. Once five units are recruited in this spot, this wall breaks open, and they can then pour out into the into the land itself. So we start with one goblin unit in the western part of the map there in the tunnel. Here's the goblins with their crossbows. So he heads there. Then there's two goblins in the north part of the map. On that one, this is similar. They recruit here, break through, go into here, and then come on down into the map. So there's two here. 
and then up on the top left is where the majority pretty much of the shadow comes into play. So we have one orc. Here's our orcs. So we have one orc here. One great orc. These guys are the tough, tough dudes in the game. Huge, hulking, great orcs. And the war, and one warg, and the wargs are really, really tough in this game if you get the right roll with them. So they, three people there with three shadow recruitment tokens. Place those here so they'll be moving the armies out in this direction. <coughs> so good setup there. In uh, the region here, we get, um, let's see, two orcs. Um, and one great orc with three recruitment tokens. Just to the east of them are three orcs and one warg unit. And three recruitment tokens. You can see they all three recruitment tokens. And then this final area here is three wargs. And three recruitment tokens of their own. And that is all the armies set up to start the game. So obviously the Shadow Army has a large host starting over here on the top right of the board. And they have some goblins coming in from the east and the northern part of the board. Three peoples are here in the middle trying to hold off the land. So the way the board is set up is important in many ways. Um, each tile has a type of region. Or different regions and then um, area spaces, areas. So um, like this here is one region. This is a plains. You can tell by these symbols. Plains, plains, swamps, hills, and then there's mountain regions. This is a, oh, sorry, I think I just quickly, I don't know if you can see anything I pointed to. And then mountain regions. A little hard to tell, but there's symbols here. So there's regions, and then there's territories, kind of like, I'm trying to think if that's the actual names they use. Um, this is the colored region basically so the territory here all these are all yellow symbols right here in this area this is the broken lands the valley is red this green area heading up here is the um, southern spur and on the top of the map up here the blue area is the eastern bank and that matters when you play the bats for the shadow and the eagles for the free people and that will come into play I'll explain that when that actually comes into play but there's a difference between regions and territories that's kind of the important thing there okay so we put all the guys out on the boards we shuffle our decks which I've already done so we have event decks which both sides use we have story decks free people story shadow story and then we have a fake deck which is useful for the for the free peoples to help bring out special units and to make their units more powerful, their heroes. Then we place the fate marker on step is zero of the fate track. This is the fate track. We put the fate marker on step zero, and you don't need to put these. I like to put one red marker to keep track of the victory points for the shadow. You don't have to do that in that base technically supposed to, but I like to do it just for myself to keep track of points without having to keep adding up on the board. Um, and then we also place the figures here. So if you see these, the map here, on this fate track there's figures. Bilbo here, Thorin, the great, uh, the Lord of the Eagles, and Bayorn are on this map. So we place those particular characters 
on their spaces. So we have Bilbo here, Thorin here, the Great Eagle, the Lord of the Eagles here, and Bayorn here. So what matters here is when this fate marker uh, goes on the same space or goes past a space with a character, that character is then active and he can come into play with the right thing later in the game. He doesn't come into play instantly. He doesn't come into play instantly, but he gets to come into play if you're able to bring him into play. But he's basically, they kind of have, they're like inactive, active, and then in play. So they're inactive once they're on here, kind of. They're active once this goes past them, and then you can put them in play under the right requirements once that happens. So that is the Fate Mark Tracker there. Um, there's Fate Tiles, just like War of the Ring. The, the Hunt Tiles, I guess, in that game. In this game, they're Fate Tiles. They get drawn at the uh, start of a turn. They're dependent on certain parameters is how many are drawn. I have them here in my bag. And this is how they look. So this number, basically if this number is drawn, that means that the shadow, the fate marker goes up one step on the fate track. There's ones, twos, and threes in here. If this marker ever gets to the end, the free people win. So the shadow army wants the fewer numbers, the better for them. That's the longer it takes to get down the track, the more time they have to take territories. The free people, of course, want that to get all the way to the end, so they can win. That is one of the victory requirements in the game. I'll explain them before we start, the rest of them. And the final setup is to give the people their dice. So the, the army, the Shadow Army gets six dice to start with. They have seven here because they can gain an extra die of a certain requirement. So we'll put that off to the side. And the free people starts with five dice. And they have an extra die that can be brought into play if certain things happen. So that is that. And that is pretty much it. We're ready to get going. So the, um, basically, the victory conditions for the game is um, certain areas are worth a certain amount of points. So there's three areas that are fortified. Up here, Eastern Spur has this symbol here. This, uh, let's see if I can get a better view of it. It's a three triangle symbol. That is a fortified site. This, sim this area is worth four points for the Shadow Army. Erebor is worth four points, it has a six. And then Raven Hill is also worth four points. And then the other areas, like the Fallen Bridge, the Ruins of Dale, which are the camp, the ruins of Dale, and the lower slopes without the fortifications are worth two points. And for the shadow player to win, they need to get ten points worth of areas. So they can get basically two fortified sites for eight, and then one other site for ten, and they win. Well, one, one fortified site, and then three of the three of the other sites and you were not fortified in the win. All right, sorry about that. I had to take a break for a second. So anyway, yeah, so the fortifications are worth four. Everything else is worth two of the named areas. Shadow player needs ten points to win. Um, at the end of the turn, he immediately wins. He doesn't have to wait to the end of the turn. One of the places he controls with after he has ten points is at the front gate of the Lonely Mountain there. So that speeds up his win. He get, immediately gets the win instead of waiting to the end of the turn. For the free people, they win if, like as I said earlier, if the fate marker gets up to 15, they'll win. If Bayorn enters play here, Bayorn is on step 11 of the fate track. If he enters play before the Shadow Army has six points, then the free people win. It's like they they didn't take enough territories in time. The fight is almost they, you know they're fighting a losing fight. Bayorn is under play. It's taking too long to hold any territories. They lose. And the other way the free peoples win is if Bold, 
who is the one general of the Shadow Army. Here's Bolg. If he enters play and is ever defeated, if he's in an army that is defeated, he's defeated as well, and if that happens, the Free Peoples win right off the bat. They just win. So, the Shadow Army, they want to bring him in because he's strong, but they have to be careful that he does not get taken out either. Okay, and that's setup of the game. Um, I wanted to get started right away, but I think we're going to just end there, and then next video, which I'll put up right away, uh, as quick as I can, of uh, playing the first turn. So that is basically the game. Well, let's, actually, there's a couple more things I want to explain before we start. Um, there's characters, like we said, Gandalf, Thranduil. So each of them have their own cards here, and they have certain abilities. So Gandalf, Bard, Thranduil, and Dane, Ironfoot are all in play at the start of the game for the Free Peoples. And then, of course, as we said, Bilbo, Thorin, the Lord of the Eagles, and the Eagles of the Mountains, they're tied together. And then Bayorn are not in play until certain events happen. And for the Shadow Army, Bolg is not in play until certain events happen. Um, I explained how they come into play. The Fate Track has to go across there, and then you spend a die to bring them into play. For Bolg, it's a little different. If at least one region in the valley contains a Shadow Army, we can use a Muster die to place Bolg in the Mustering region. So as long as one region in the valley contains an army, so even if the Shadow Army just gets right here, they don't have to take territory, they just have to get inside of the valley, then Bolg can technically enter play. Um, we place a Great Orc in the same region with him. We flip one recruitment token in each mustering region when he comes into play. And we place one bodyguard token on this card. So the bodyguard tokens are a special thing that he gets. So anytime an army takes damage, that he, if he's in that army, he can get rid of one of the bodyguards to take that, make that damage down to zero. And that army takes no damage. So it's very powerful. The thing is, if you bring him in once um, the shadow controls the ruins of Dale which is in the middle of the valley here, then he'll get three bodyguard tokens. If you bring it in before that, he only gets one. So you kind of want to wait. And you want to try to get that Ruins of Dale before you bring him in to make him stronger. Because remember, if he dies, then um, the Shadow loses. So going for the Ruins of Dale pretty early to try to get Balg in as strong as possible is a good, good idea for the Shadow people. Okay, so... Those are the characters. We'll explain how they use their abilities and everything once we start getting into the game. And that's it for now. So we're going to um, finish up this video with the setup of the game so you can kind of see how it goes in that way. And then we'll get into playing the next video. Thanks for watching, guys, and we'll see you later. Take care.